right, so we figured it out then. The Zoom. We like, did. This, this, you've never been able to do this before. Uh uh. How did you make it through the pandemic then without doing Zoom? Uh, I started playing golf. <laughs> oh, I did. what I was doing golf. right before I ran in here. Okay. Interesting. Do you ever play golf with Alice Cooper? Because I know you uh, produced one of his albums. Uh, no, I never did. I've never, I never played golf. I never picked up a golf club. I didn't have time until, until the pandemic. And so I was sitting around working on a jigsaw puzzle of all things, uh, just to try to like, let my mind wander a little bit. And I thought, well, this is really stupid. Let's go do something. Now we've got nothing but time. So I went and started taking some golf lessons and there is no one on planet earth that sucks at golf more than me. Me? No, I'm worse. I guarantee you. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's what I was, that's what I did. And I didn't zoom anybody during, uh, during the pandemic. I just stayed busy and between golf and gym and then mixing. That's what I did. That's a great, yeah, I need to get more into golf. I'm really bad, but I like the thing that I love about it is the golf courses. I live in Arizona right now and they have some of the most beautiful golf courses you'll ever see. And I just, but I'm so terrible. I don't want to like embarrass myself. And yeah. Well, have you gotten, I'm, 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 I'm there if you ever want to not embarrass yourself. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's go together and just be terrible. I think that would, th that's what I always, I only golf with people who are terrible. The people that actually love golf and are really good. I'm like, you don't want to golf with me. I'm, I'm really bad, but it's fun. It's fun to go. Yeah. And, yeah. Or like top golf. That's another fun thing. Have you ever done that? I haven't done that. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause it's fun. It's kind of like bowling. Like it keeps score and stuff and you can just, it doesn't matter if you screw up on that. Cause then you're not, you know, there's not people behind you waiting to play and all those kinds of things. Well, so. I spend most of the time on the driving range because, oh. you know, I'm, I'm still trying to get my stroke down. I'm still trying to be able to figure out, okay, I only want it to go 50 yards, not 150 yards. Right. Right. And so okay. I'm, I'm about two hours every day on the range and in Texas, wow. it's tough because at six o'clock in the morning, it's already 90. Oh, but it's same in Arizona. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Especially in, in the summer, you basically just, I mean, I think there's people that still golf in the summer and I think they're crazy. But I mean, from like October to through May, it's like amazing to golf. Good, I would think, yeah. I think it's some of the best weather. I mean, you know, it's great. So I'm ready. That's cool. So golf, that's cool that you're able to, I mean, do you find yourself able to do more different hobbies now that you have the time? that you can relax a little bit. You, you don't have the uh, record company, the back-to-back -back albums, the pressure. I mean, you're, you're kind of, are you kind of semi-retired in a way? No, I just, I work when I want to. I don't work when I don't want to. My wife and I travel extensively all over the world. We've actually been to every continent on planet earth, believe it or not. Okay, wait a minute. Now we got to talk Antarctica because I am fascinated by Antarctica. So you've been to Antarctica? twice and what was did you see anything crazy like there's all these conspiracy theories about it oh, i just read it online i don't know no it, it was just it's it's otherworldly it, it's it's very beautiful and um the first trip we just we just went on a small boat and then that company conan actually built uh an icebreaker a proper icebreaker so that you know you could really travel into areas that that most people can't go and uh so no we've done it twice it was just great i'll do it again too if i can yeah because isn't a, there's a lot of antarctica that has never been explored that's my understanding as well yeah and um but it's it's a it's a really fantastic trip i mean coming in you hit a couple of small islands. There's one island that has 1 million penguins on it. Wow. No people at all, just 1 million penguins. And they and must live in harmony because, yeah, there's no people to screw it up. No, there's, and, and I don't think that there's, well, there's natural predators in the ocean, but once they get up on land, I mean, it's, it's the weirdest thing because you, you can, it's just mile after mile after mile of elbow to elbow penguins. It's kind of hard to even imagine. Yeah. Do they have any predators? Like the, the polar bears eat them or what, what other animals? Well, there aren't polar bears down on Antarctica. The polar bears are up north. 
Oh, okay. So there's circle. so there's penguins. What else, what other animals are there? Penguins, walruses, uh, lots of birds and stuff like that. But I don't I don't think anything eats the penguins until it gets in the water. And then of course you know you've got whale sharks and sharks and all sorts of other fun things going on. Lots of whale sharks. I mean, lots of uh, orcas down there. Did you see a lot of orcas and whale I sharks? Did. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm from Seattle and I had been, lived there for most of my life. Then I moved to Arizona, but I, I went back and I did a whale watching and we got lucky and we got to see, a, a, what do you call it? A, a pod of orcas. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Just amazing to see. So yeah. yeah, cool stuff. Well, anyway, so we should probably talk some music or people are going to get mad at me. Why'd you have Bull Hill on? And you talked about Antarctica. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that stuff's fascinating to me too. But yeah, music, your path is so fascinating to me. I'm just really into people's path to success and like how did you get there i mean you end up being this uh you know record producer award-winning multi-million dollar you know record producer how did you go from i guess it starts really with the rat album but you started before that it was you start as a janitor and a produce as a in a production assistant basically at this studio so how long was it when you i think you were 17 at that to, to when you produced the first rat album how, how long of a span was that your journey to, to when you basically kind of made it at that point? Well, um, the, the rat record we did in 83. And so I was going to college in Colorado and that's when I got a job, uh, at a small jingle studio and I started out as a janitor and but I, I had always loved being in the studio because I was in the studio a couple of times with my high school band. And I mean, my rock and roll band, not the high school band that played at football games. And uh, and I really just fell in love with the whole process. So I wanted to be around it as much as possible. And so I would do my job and then I would go sit in the corner in the studio and keep my mouth shut and and watch what people were doing. And then after a while, I think something happened. One of the assistant engineers didn't show up and they needed, and the engineer was screaming for somebody to, to uh, work on the patch bay. And I said, I could do that. And so then, you had watched other people do it, right? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I said, and, and, and I asked questions and I hung out and when Pete, when the maintenance guys were in there, I'd go in and, and drive them crazy. And uh, you know, how do you do that? Why, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And and, you know, and they taught me. And then I kind of worked my way up to where I was like actually engineering. But again, these are jingles. You know, these are 40 second jingles in, in uh, high school bands and polka bands and choirs and church things, you know, nothing serious at all. And and I was in the studio one day by myself and this giant guy walks in. And he says, my name's John Keyworth. I'm the starting fullback for the Denver Broncos. I've got $10,000 and I want to make a rock and roll record. Can you help me? <laughs> exactly. oh, I haven't heard this story before. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, absolutely. He had no music. So all of my broke musician friends that were songwriters, check. Okay, I'll get, get them some, some business. He had no band. And so all my broke musician friends, including myself, check, check. Um, and he was a great guy. And he gave me season passes to the Broncos the first year they ever went to the Super Bowl. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And now the record, the record was, was medium at best. Uh, it didn't sell anything other than to the Denver Bronco fans. But it was, you know, you, you had to start someplace. So that was actually my first real bona fide production that I actually got paid for. Wow. That, I didn't know that part of the story. That's really interesting. <laughs> and then didn't you also, um, you would convince the studio owner to uh, allow you and your band to kind of work after hours. And so you started experimenting with different things. What are, is there any weird techniques that you discovered? Cause I know like the guns and roses song, it, what, brings to mind is a Guns N' Roses song, uh, Dead Horse with Mike Clink, where they used a the nutcracker. Did you find mm -hmm. any weird things like that that you? Yeah, well, first of all, that that part of my life, I think I managed to make 
some of the worst recordings ever on planet Earth. But I was learning and I was experimenting. Right. So, you know, we would get a magazine and they would say, uh, Roy Baker is using plus nine on Agfa tape or something like that. So I'd race out and get some Agfa tape, come in, crank it up to plus nine and see what happened. And so it was a lot of that kind of experimenting. And OK, so let's if, if we like this mic, then let's try this one. If we like this pattern on the mic, let's try this one. Let's do them out of phase and see what happens. Let's you know, and so it was just a lot of technical kind of malpractice. Um, but it, it led me to, OK, this works. This doesn't work. This is my style. This isn't my style. And. Yeah, and so we would go in there from about nine o'clock at night until four or five in the morning, and play all night long, and uh, and we had the uh, the Winger brothers were in there with me in that time period as well. So it was a it was a great time, and I was really lucky that I was able to to convince the studio owner that you know. Hey, I'll get better. I'll get faster. We'll get more people. You know, you'll make more money. Blah 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 blah. Is there expenses at that point? Because obviously now with computers, you can just re-record and stuff. But at that point, when you're experimenting, do you does it cost money to use the tape and stuff? Is that something you would no. just pay for out of pocket? Or yes, I mean, yeah. And the, and for a broke musician, you know, a reel of two inch tape was a pretty um, precious commodity back then. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could, and we, we did stupid stuff. Like we'd use the same roll of tape over and over and over again until the backing fell off and <laughs> you couldn't use it for anything, but it was, I mean, it was a very, very important part of, of my development. And I don't, I don't know how other engineer, producer, musicians have done it, but I don't know how I could have possibly wound up where I wound up without having had, you know, two years of, of the most ugly noises ever. Well, yeah. And didn't you also learn a lot from working with a uh, record producer, Keith Olson? And can you talk about any of the records that you got to see him uh, record? Like which bands was he working with when you watched him? Okay. Well, how I met Keith was pretty interesting. Uh, my high school rock and roll band, had gotten a gig. This was the the same year that Woodstock was happening. And so everybody was doing pop festivals and rock festivals all over the country. And there was a rock festival up in Lubbock, Texas. And for some, and I don't remember who connected the dots, but anyway, we got contacted, please come out and play. And we did. And there was a there was a promoter from California. Um, I forget what his name is. He uh, he and a uh, financial backer named Marco Perco. How could you not remember that name? <laughs> uh, they came they came to that show. They saw my band. They said, "Wow, we think you're really good. We'd like to do some demos with you." Okay, and I was living in Dallas. And so they called me up and they said, okay, we're going to fly out and we're going to bring our engineer, Keith Olson. And so Keith was a staff engineer at Sound City at the time. And he came out and ran our session and more or less produced it because no one else knew what the hell they were doing. And Keith and I became really good friends. And so I was still in high school. And he called me up and he said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing some, uh, I'm going to produce a couple of sessions. Do you want to, you want to fly out and, and sit in? And I was like, yeah, long weekend, no problem. And, and there's a, a fun Stevie Nicks tie in here that's pretty amazing. Oh yeah, I definitely want to talk about Stevie Nicks. Uh, so I, f I flew out and slept on the couch and I went to the studio with him every day and he was doing uh, Dominic Triano and uh, David Foster was working for him as a studio musician. So I, I met, you know, oh, actually David was working playing keyboards on Alice Cooper that I think Keith did. Now I, I may have that wrong. Um, 
and then he was doing an all girl group called Bertha and um and I don't really remember all the other groups and then he started doing um Buckingham Knicks ah. which was pre uh um Fleetwood Mac and Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. and uh so to digress slightly, one of the days that I was sleeping on the couch, I was woken up by all by a lot of noise in the living room. And that is when I met Stevie Nicks, Keith's maid. And uh, that's that's how I met her. And yeah. She, well, what, what was your first impression of her? Because I know people know she's obviously an amazing singer, but and, and she's very beautiful now, but especially back then, I mean, she was a complete knockout. She was totally gorgeous, right? Yeah. Um, and she and Lindsay would barter for studio time with Keith. So she would come down, clean, clean the uh, flat or Keith's house. And, uh, and I don't know what Lindsay did, fix the car, mow the lawn, something like that. But anyway, they, it was a barter thing. And Keith was very interested in them. And so that's kind of how Buckingham Knicks started. And then I, let me see, where am I in my timeline? Okay. So Keith and I had become friends. He'd already recorded my band. I'd gone to California. And then uh, I, about a year later, I packed up my band. I said, okay, we're going to California. And so we went out there and, um, starved and but i kept going to the studio with keith all the time and learned as much as i possibly could as a matter of fact i mean he is he is clearly the uh, the the foundation of my production and, and engineering career i mean every single day hmm what would keith do and so then you know we just kind of progressed from there. And then I, I left California because I was starving too much. And I came to Colorado to go to school just in case I needed to get my law degree or something to uh, make ends meet. And then I went to the studio and I was starting to do all these demos like we'd already talked about. So about a year and a half in, I wound up with about, I don't know, 15 or 16 two-inch masters of stuff that I had written or I'd written with my pals or whatever. And I sent some of them to Keith. I said, just point me in the right direction. What am I, what are you hearing? That's right. What's wrong. And he was very complimentary. He said, I think these are great. And he was at that time, he was now becoming Keith Olson famous producer. And he was being managed by Irving Azoff at frontline management from the Eagles fame. And so he took the demos and played them for Irving. And Irving said, get this guy out here right now. So Keith picked up the phone and called me and he said, Irving wants to meet you. Can you come out? And I went, uh, yeah. And so I went out and, and this is not a fishing story. Uh, Irving set up six appointments for us and Keith, Keith lugged me around and we went to six different record companies and I had six different offers in one day. And this was with your band Airborne is the first. This Airborne. was with what became Airborne. Okay. This was just Bo Hill jerking around in the studio making demos, and and some of them sounded okay. And so I had, uh, I had a deal. I mean, it was very funny because we would go in these uh, in the record president's office, and they all knew Keith, and it was like, "Hi, Keith, how are you?" Blah 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 blah. Keith said, "Check this out." stuck the cassette in and I was kind of just hanging out, standing in the doorway and he, no one knew who I was, nor should they, should they have. And, you know, and all these guys were listening to this project that the hot producer Keith Olson brought in and said, Hey, this is my new find. And they're all going crazy and going, Oh my God, this is really great. When can I meet these people? And he said, well, he's standing in the door. <laughs> and that was, that was me. And so I walked in and met everybody and, and, you know, very honestly, I said, look, I've got some guys I really love playing with, but we, we don't really have a band yet. And so everybody was more than willing to kind of let that go for the moment because they knew, you know, that 
based on Keith's reputation and Irving's reputation, finding people to fill in the ranks of a new band was not going to be a big problem. So that's kind of how that whole Keith Olsen beginning, the genesis of my. So then what happened with Airborne? Because I know that band fell apart, right? Well, what happened with Airborne was we got, we picked Columbia um, and God, I'm, I'm trying to, anyway, the head of A&R of Columbia at the time was a uh, senior moment. Anyway, uh, we really liked him. Everything was really great. The record was done. Everybody was very excited about it. There was a rumor that we were going to go out and open for the cars. And then all of a sudden, uh, the a &R guy writes us a letter and he says, best of luck, I'm leaving to become president of RCA. And so we are sitting there with a record ready, ready to come out with no one driving the bus. No one. And so, you know, it came out and sp sputtered around a little bit here and there, but there was no energy behind it from the label because, you know, our rabbi had gone. Gotcha. And nobody else knew who in the hell we were or, or why we were there or anything else, nor did they care, which was fine. I mean, it wasn't fine at the time, but but now that I understood the business a little bit better, I I got it. But so the band basically broke up. John Pierce and Mike Baird were L.A. studio musicians, very successful, and they decided to stay in L.A. And I went back to Colorado to my old studio with my guitar player, David Zajcek, and uh, Larry Stewart, who was also a guitar player, singer. And we started working on Airborne 2, same drill. So I'm doing jingles during the day, and I'm but I'm very focused. I understand, okay, this is what we need to do to make the to make a master record. And then the idea was, I thought, well, I'll just record it myself here and then we'll take it and sell it. And that was a lot, that looked a lot better on paper than it did in practicality. And also because I was back in Colorado. So it wasn't like I could bump down the street and see John Kalodner or somebody like that. So anyway, so that thing, fell apart at a certain point it was just it we couldn't glue it together anymore so at that point i said i really need a break so i moved to the bahamas and became a dive master oh i didn't know this part of the story either wow <laughs> yeah i was in the bahamas um and i became a dive master and i was working at a uh, small hope bay lodge on andros island in the bahamas and I'd been there a few months. And then I got a call from Keith Olson. And Keith said, hey, what are you doing? I told him we, we sort of caught up. And he said, listen, I just got a call from Bud Prager, who was Foreigner's manager. And he said, Foreigner is looking for uh, another member to go on tour, a guy that, that can sing and play keys and, and guitar. Would you be interested in auditioning? And I was like, sure. So I jumped on a plane and went up and met with Bud. And somehow between when I left the Bahamas and like three or four days later, when I wound up in New York, they had already picked the guy that they wanted. But uh, Bud was gracious enough to have a meeting with me and he listened to, to my stuff and said, yeah, look, I'll keep an eye out and blah, 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 blah. So not too much happened from that. And I was crashing at a friend's house and he was literally just kind of like a new friend. And I was going through his record collection and I found a record from a band called Spider, which I knew about. And I, and I was familiar with their record and I was just chatting with the guy and I said, man, whatever happened to these guys? They were really great. You know, Holly Knight was writing all the material and all that. And he said, oh, well, they're, they're good friends of mine. And and their keyboard player just left, which was Holly, had just quit. And I said, can you get me an audition? Can you connect me with these guys? And he said, yeah, they're real good friends of mine. So long story short, I auditioned, 
they said, sure, let's go. And Spider was being managed by Bill Coin of Kiss and Billy Idol fame. And so once the band was filled out, he liked what he was hearing, blah, 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 and uh, got us a deal uh, on Chrysalis. And the name of the band was Shanghai. And we did the Shanghai record. And back in those days, when you finish your record and you deliver it, there's usually about a three month setup time to get the promo going, to get the, I don't think they were doing videos yet, but anyway, to get to get the record set up properly and to get it put in the various marketplaces that you needed to go. And while that was happening, um, I got a call from a, a guy in Texas. Hey, would you come down here and co-produce these demos with me? Well, I was just sitting in New York rotting at that point. So I said, sure, love to. And um, and I went to New York or to a uh, back to Dallas and started recording uh, a group called uh, The Sirens, which was Sandy Stewart. And I don't remember exactly. Oh, yeah. So and then we were sending these demos over to back to Keith in in L.A. I was just sending him stuff. You know, what do you think? How's it going? Blah, blah. And and Keith played him for to Jimmy Ivey and Jimmy was dating Stevie at the time. Stevie fell in love with this stuff. Now she had no connection that I was the guy that was sleeping on Keith's couch. I was just, I wasn't, I wasn't, my name wasn't even mentioned because I was uh, a nobody broke musician and I was helping my friend produce this stuff. So Stevie, when they were, when Fleetwood came through Dallas, she wanted to, go to the studio and meet Sandy and do everything. And, and while I was down there, I called Kip and his two brothers and they had a song called Heather. And so I asked Stevie, I said, would you mind doing a background vocal on Heather for us? And so I've got a, I've got a cassette of pre winger of, of Kip and his brothers doing a song called Heather with Stevie Nicks. <laughs> yeah, I heard this story. This is so crazy to me. I'm surprised this is not on Wikipedia anywhere. And there's no, I couldn't find a uh, YouTube demo of this song, but uh, it sounds fascinating. Mm. Well, if I had a working cassette player, <laughs> I could play it for you. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the muddy part of this was we're, we're, doing this record stevie falls in love with sandy and and her writing skills and everything else and she calls doug morris president of atlantic and says i want you to sign this girl and doug was like why i mean what why would i want why and she said doug i love this artist and if you don't sign her i'm quitting <laughs> or something wow. like that and so doug doug said okay begrudgingly so and he didn't want her on Atlantic, so he put her on Modern Records, which was Paul Fishkin's sub-label, which I think was, Stevie was the only artist on Modern, I think. Hmm. Um, but anyway, Modern was a subsidiary of, of Atlantic. And so what happened was the guy that I was supposedly co-producing the thing with, I would do, the, I would, would record everything and mix it. And then Doug said he wanted to hear rough mixes every week because he he thought this was absolutely scatterbrained, you know, for him to go sign an artist because Stevie was going to get pissed at him if he didn't. And um, and the guy that I was working with, well, I won't tell you who it is, um, took my name off the off the mixes and took mix credit for himself, and started sending them to Doug wow, this is really great, blah, blah, blah. And so we're finished recording. We're getting ready to take it to LA to mix it. And uh, and Sandy submitted, you know, said, okay, I need a ticket for Bo and a ticket for Bill and a ticket for for whoever. And then came back, who the hell's Bo? And she said, oh, he's the guy that's that's been producing and mixing this stuff. No, he's not. It was Mr. X. No, you're wrong. 
Mr. X didn't do anything. He sat in his office while Bo was in there mixing. And I co-wrote a couple of things with Sandy as well. So gigantic brouhaha. So they begrudgingly lug me along out to California. And it's like, it's like time to get to work. Let's make the record. Let's finish it. Blah, 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 blah. And Sandy said, I want Bo to do it. And, and Doug said, this is just making me crazy. I have no idea who this Bo guy is. So here's what we're going to do. I'm coming to California tomorrow and we're going to sit down and hash this out. So I said, okay. So Doug came, came to Sound City. Jimmy was there. Shelly Yakis was there. Mr. X was there. I was there. And Sandy. And Doug walks in the door and he says, okay, I know how we're going to figure this out. I'm going to, I'm going to sit right next to Bo and he's going to mix the record live right in front of me. And then I'll make a decision. So he gave, we were at Sound City, Studio B. He gave me one pass to set up the mix to at least get the returns correct and get, to get a basic balance. And then he came and sat right next to me and he said, okay, mix it. And I did it. And I, I mixed the whole record live in front of him and then he walked out and everybody was expecting me to get hand and to get fired off of it and doug walked out and walked right over to uh to jimmy iv and he said this guy's mixing the record and he pointed at me so we finished the record i'm back in new york now my shanghai record still has not come out yet <laughs> and so finally so spider yes and so I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to be doing at this point. And then three weeks after I finished Sandy's record, I got a call from Doug's office. And uh, uh, do you have a moment to speak to Mr. Morris? I was like, of course. And so Doug got on the phone. And he said, hey, listen, uh, I'm going to sign this rock band from California if you'll produce them. Will you get on a plane and go see them with me tomorrow? And I was really? He said, yeah. I said, yes, sir. I'd love to. And the thing that endeared me to Doug, among many things, was I figured I'm going to sit in coach and he's going to sit in first class. But he didn't. He sat in coach with me. It would have been cooler if you guys would have sat in first class together, though. It would have. But <laughs> but the fact that he did that, I thought um, I just thought, man, that's that's pretty exceptional yeah so because i know you said something about to the effect of when you were 11 that hey this is what i want to do i want to make records but i mean there was you know you had an audition or an offer to maybe audition for foreigner you had these two other bands at that point were you okay with giving up the dream of playing in a band because you know there, there could have been a part of you that had an ego that said no i'm not a i don't want to mix stuff i want to play in a band but you you wanted to make records more than you wanted to play in a band, right? Yeah. And to be completely honest, I mean, I was, you know, my career was going nowhere and I was getting really <laughs> sick of eating top ramen every day or a 75 cent slice of D'Agostino's pizza. And so I was keeping all my options open. So I figured if Shanghai takes off, I'm there. Great. If anything else takes off, great. And so I went to California with Doug. We said, yeah, we're going to do the deal. And, and that's what started, what really started everything. And then based on the success of RAT, I mean, my next decision was pretty easy because I was getting people lined up that wanted to work with me that were going to pay me uh, uh, a ridiculous advance, at least ridiculous to me back in those days. And so it was, it was pretty easy. So when Shanghai came out, it, you know, same thing, it sputtered and had upheaval at Chrysalis at that time. And over, and basically everybody was just threw up their hands. And I said, okay, that's fine. Cause I was in the middle of making a record with Brad. So then when did you work with Stevie Nicks? Cause you worked on one of her records. You, you co-wrote some songs, although you didn't get credit. And, and I thought you, I heard you say something like Prince came in to record with her. What is yeah. this story? Well, this was on, I forget if, if it was Wild Heart or or one of those. Anyway, we had Sandy and all of her crew was in town at the same time that Stevie was in town and at the same time that that um, 
Jimmy and Shelly. And, you know, we were all just kind of there. And the songwriting part was, was songs that I had written with Sandy that Stevie swooped in and said, I like that. I want to take that. And Sandy gave, gave them to her. Uh, much to my chagrin and dismay, because they were um, obviously they, they became hits with Stevie. And I think they could have become hits with Sandy. But Sandy felt, well, I don't want to put any any words in her mouth, but she she wanted to uh, uh, be cooperative with Stevie as much as she could. Really? And, That's interesting. Yeah, it it was it was weird. I mean, because I co She got the songwriting it. credits for it then, right? Huh? She got the songwriting. These are her songs that she wrote or somebody else wrote for her? For Stevie? For, so you said Sandy gave the songs to Stevie. So Sandy yeah. wrote these songs? Yes, Sandy and I. And if you look on the label copy of, of Stevie's solo record, you'll see you'll never see my name show up as a yeah. writer because of Mr. X. But you will see my publishing company, Small Hope Music. Oh. Okay, yeah. So because like I know if anyone what is it? If anyone falls and nothing ever changes, those oh, and Nightbird, those are all three yeah. co written with Sandy Stewart, right? And you, and you were those ones that you co wrote as well, you just didn't get credit, yeah. yeah. Well, I think they credited my publishing company, but Mr. X wanted to, uh, had an axe to grind, and so he wasn't going to do anything that was going to help me. So, this Mr. X, like he, he made it in the business, he was just uh, stepping over people to get there. Not really. Oh, just at this early juncture, he was still a factor. Yeah, he. I mean, it would. He was in the right place at the right time. Okay. And and he was sort of the conduit with the whole Stevie Nicks, Jimmy Iovine connection with all of that crazy stuff. And you still don't want to say his name after all these years. <laughs> no, it, it won't. It won't change anything, and it won't make anything any better. Yeah. So what was your relationship like with Stevie Nicks? Like, did you guys hang out? Because I know um, I read something about like how she had a cocaine thing. Did you ever see her do cocaine? Like she seemed kind of naive about it. Like, oh, I didn't know it was going to be bad for me or whatever. My lips are sealed. Oh, well, <laughs> you're a class act, Bo. I like it. I like it. But Yeah. Um, well, I guess we we hung out to the to whatever extent that I was was with Sandy, because Sandy was around Stevie all the time back in those days, and I was around Sandy all the time, and you know so yeah we were. I, I think I was more of a bother than anything else. I was just like part of part of the troop, and uh, and again. Nobody knew me from an odd hole. I hadn't sold any records. I hadn't done anything meaningful at all. And so Stevie was being, and I think in all fairness, she was being quite generous to let me hang out without her, you know, calling security and saying, get that asshole off my couch. You know. What did you notice just watching Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham, two of the greatest songwriters of all time were they always like working or do you think they just had such creative genius that they could hang out and relax and then when it was time to write songs they get the hits just came to them well i wish i could tell you something a little juicier but i never saw them uh writing at all i mean the stuff that they were it was done you know yeah. here's your acoustic guitar play the song bam 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 and they play it so that was done, I think, probably up in San Francisco in those days. And then when they came down, the songs were done and Keith just needed to record them. Sure. OK, so you get the job with Rat. We got to talk Rat. I know you've told a lot of these stories before um, <laughs> how you know crazy it was. You got fired every time they made a record and such. But you, you made an interesting comment on the first record uh, out of the cellar how the band was kind of destitute when they got signed and then they had massive success relatively quickly. And you said something about how that can mess with somebody's head. Can you elaborate on that? I'm just very curious about that comment. It sounded really interesting. Well, um, when you go from like gutter snipe, which is, you know, living below the poverty line and then 
12 months later, you're filing a tax return for 1.2 million. Sometimes that, you know, not everybody can handle that kind of dynamic range. Um, and don't forget, you know, like Warren was 19 when when that phenomenon happened. And and the other guys, you know, they were a little bit older, but but nonetheless, it's going from I'm sure it's probably the same with like professional athletes. I know? was thinking the exact same thing. That's a great yeah. analogy. If if you go from rags to riches, literally. Mm -hmm. And and the movie business, the record business, and sports are the only things that I can think of right off the top of my head where where that type of of dynamic could could actually happen. And sometimes people are mature enough to understand that this is not normal <laughs> and you know, and conduct themselves accordingly. And then there's those others that are like, wow, this has happened. I'm going to be on this gravy train for the rest of my life. I'm taking my girlfriend to Paris for lunch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is interesting because uh, it's different than, let's say, if they won the lottery and it's just pure luck. I mean, it sounds like I read Stephen Piercy's book and it sounds like he had a very strong work ethic. Like they really grind, at least I don't know about the rest of him, but from what he could say about himself, he really grinded and, and pushed to get his band to where they were. Like he was, you know, having to argue with, uh, or, you know, convince uh, club owners to have their band play and all those kinds of things. Like they really pushed for their band to be where they, and then when they got there, it's like, but maybe it was still kind of a shock. Well, you know, I don't know that part of, of Stephen's history, you know, the, the pre Atlantic mm -hmm. years, uh, you know, other than little bits and pieces that I, that I picked up, but yeah, I mean, Stephen always seemed to me like he was, he was very determined to make it happen. And and Stephen and I developed a very unusual relationship, but it worked. So we didn't mess with it too much. What what was unusual about it? Well, for the first record, as you as you probably know, Rat did not want me to produce it. Right. And they didn't particularly like me. I was thrust upon them and they begrudgingly had to accept me. And in that process, they had no reason to trust my judgment. They had no reason to listen to anything I had to say. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame them one single bit. So every suggestion from an arrangement point of view or from a melodic point of view, any suggestion that I came up with, was generally speaking met with a giant fuck you no and after a while i was making melody suggestions to steven and he went oh, okay i'll try that and then it that relationship just grew and so it it became okay what do you want me to sing here and I'd hum it to him over, over the mic. I'd say, okay, why don't you try this? And then put one of your hey's on the end of it or something like that. And he'd do it. And then the guy and the guys in the band started listening to it and they started going, well, yeah, I, know. I guess that's okay. And uh, so by the time the second record came around, the uh, I really realized what a monster I had created inadvertently because Steven stopped coming to pre-production rehearsals. He just wouldn't come. And everybody in the band was starting to get a little pissed. And so they confronted Steven. They said, hey, man, you got to start showing up to uh, pre-production. He said, why? Bo's going to write the parts for me anyway, so why do I need to go to pre-production and try him? He's just going to change them anyway. Yeah, so, so Steven, he trusted you enough to, to make those decisions at that point. He, he kind of knew that you were going to win out your decisions. Well, yeah, but, but I kind of under, I, I kind of understood Steven's strengths and weaknesses. And so I obviously tried to steer everything that was going to be his strength. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it, Steven was no pushover. Don't, don't get me wrong. And if he didn't like something that I told him, you know, he'd, he'd say, no, that, that complete crap, I'm not doing it. But for the most part, we kind of, 
became one, <laughs> I guess, without that sounding too weird. Yeah. But, but I kind of understood him and he kind of understood me. And then we just kind of worked it that way. Yeah. Well, I've had, I had Steven on the show. I've had Juan on the show. Both were very, seemed pretty mellow, easygoing guys, very respectful. I've, I've never had Blotzer on the show, but I've seen interviews. I know you said he's been difficult to work with, but what was, a, I haven't seen a lot of interviews with Warren, at least nothing recent. What was his personality like in the studio? He was, he was generally pretty quiet. Um, and I, I would, I would say almost reclusive. But he 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 didn't have a real explosive, bigger than life personality, at least not around me. Um, and you know, he did all his talking with the guitar on, and uh, and and that's, I mean, he played so many solos, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out, okay, I need to say something to justify my job, and I'm sitting there going, I can't, I can't improve on this one bit. I, it's perfect. Just leave it alone. You know, which is kind of weird because, but I did learn over over the years is that the 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 least amount of input that I had, the better it was, because I had to learn how to just shut up, and just accept a great performance when it's just laid right out there in front of me, and just go, wow, very good, thank you, and end of story well there you go while to get there yeah no that's and then you had obviously multiple albums that were successful with them but um talk about the uh, album that you worked with uh alice cooper I, explain this to me because it says co-produced it was a constrictor album it says co-produced with michael wagner who's also one of my favorite producers did you guys do separate songs or did you uh, work every song together uh i did all the recording all the arrangements everything and then uh, when we finished the record, they wanted uh, Michael to remix it. And I guess that was part of his negotiation with them that was that he wanted a co-production credit. And, you know, and I had, again, I had very little wiggle room. I had nothing to say about it. I mean, Shep said, this is what I want to do and that's the way it's going to be. So I went, okay. So Michael and I never actually were in the studio together ever. <laughs> oh, did you ever meet him? Because he's, he, you guys are such two of my favorite producers. You, you're so uh, both so uh, similar, I think, in a lot of ways. A, a lot of you both produce uh, Warrant for one. I mean, you produce a lot of the similar sounding bands. Um, I think that I have met Michael a couple of times, but literally it was just meeting him. Hey man, how's it going? Good to see you. So no, we never really collaborated or worked together on anything. And, and you're right. I mean, he, and he is a really, really, really good producer for sure. Did you have other, I mean, I guess Keith Olson, cause he was kind of like your mentor, but did, was there other producers that you were friends with that you could commiserate about like, Oh yeah. Don't you hate it when bands do this or talk production techniques or anything? Sam Taylor. Sam Taylor. Yeah. Who, wait, remind me who that I, I'm probably going to sound stupid for not knowing who that is. Is that that's a, a producer? A famous yeah, King, King's X. Oh, I love King. I've had Doug on twice. He's a yeah, he's I think the King's X is brilliant, very underrated for sure. Very underrated. Yeah, Sam and I uh became friends, and I was actually best man at his wedding. And uh he is like one of one of my absolute favorite producers. And so he and I, we could we could talk about the jerky personalities of certain members of certain bands. And at the same time, we could also talk about, now, how in the hell did you get that guitar sound? You did what? You know, and so, and we could, we could have that conversation back and forth. And Sam's also a tremendously talented um, uh, musician and writer. And I think he was the director of all of those King's X videos as well. So he was like fully hands-on with everything. Yeah, that's a band that um, I just did a, a little segment on my YouTube channel, 10 Most Underrated Bands, and they were on that list because I, I think they really are super underrated. And it always seemed like whenever I read interviews, other musicians would always say that was one of their most favorite uh, influential bands at the time. I, I couldn't agree more. It was They were very influential to me. And 
and I just we were uh, Winger was playing at Santa Monica Civic, and I went to our agent and because I knew that King's X was out in that part of the universe, and I said, "Can you get them to open for us?" And he he made it happen. So King's X opened for Winger at Santa Monica Civic, and I was backstage, and I saw Sam. I knew who he was. He didn't know who I was. And I walked up to him and I said, I just want you to know that you're one of my favorite producers. And he didn't realize that it was me until months later. Wow. So I just, and I, just shook it, I shook his hand and I said, great job. That was it. That's cool. Cause that's the, the, the time before social media. So people like, I remember seeing your name on all the backs of these records, but I don't know that I had ever seen a picture of you until years later when the internet came out and stuff. Cause you, they don't put your picture in the, the album mm -hmm. notes for some reason. <laughs> Maybe they should have. Too ugly. <laughs> well, tell me about this. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this project. Um, did you work on this hearts of fire soundtrack? You produced and arranged some songs with uh was it bob dylan and eric clapton and ron wood did you work with those songs or which ones did you work with on that um all of them yeah oh. we did uh yeah i had uh i was finishing up dancing undercover and fiona was already in england doing uh principal photography for the for the film and and I was supposed to deliver all of Fiona's music. And so I got over there and I was, I was done. My music was ready to go, ready for principal photography. And I got a call from the director, Richard Marquand, who did uh, the second Jedi movie or whatever, Star Wars movie. Yeah. He did that one. And, um, and, he, and I went to his trailer and I said, yes, sir. I, I did not just met him once before and I, and I was, you know, he's the boss. And so I was like, yes, sir. And he said, well, I've got a real problem. Uh, Dylan was supposed to have music ready yesterday for principal photography. And I just got a call from the studio and those guys are down there and they're burning through tape and they haven't gotten one song done. Would you please go down and fix that? I said, yes, sir. So I went to air London no, no, townhouse, townhouse London. And I walked into the control room and they had one of the second engineers was running the session. So basically all he was doing was he just kept putting on reels of tape, running it, and then they would jam or, or fart around doing whatever they were doing. And so there were like 15 reels of two inch piled up on the floor and they hadn't gotten one song out of the batch. And so I go to, to the control room glass and I look outside and I see Eric Clapton, Bob Dylan, Ron Wood, Eric's drummer, Henry Spinetti. And I was just sitting there going, wow, what a weird life I lead. <laughs> that is and, fucking amazing. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. And so, you know, I went in, introduced myself and said, you know, I was trying to be as diplomatic as possible and said, listen, uh, Richard wanted me to come down and just see if I could lend a hand. And um, Eric and Henry Spinetti were completely sober, totally sober. Dylan and Ron Wood were not sober. <laughs> and so- and Was like just drunk or was there drugs involved or what do uh, we- my, my lips are sealed, but, but I can't tell you. Okay. I can tell you that we had half of the band that was focused and the other half of, shall we just say, different focus. <laughs> and so I took some time and I scanned through, you know, the tapes to see if there was anything in there that I could resurrect. And I found a couple of a couple of things that, I OK, if we can clean this up here and fix this and do that, blah, blah. And um you know, and Eric was was sort of looking at me with with these giant eyes, kind of going, "Thank you, we needed some help." And uh, so, anyway, long story short, uh, the dumb shit kid from Texas is producing artists that I grew up with, and I actually had Eric Eric Clapton said, 
Well, Bo, how was that? Was that okay? Would you like for me to try another one? This is Eric Clapton talking to me. And I was, I, I, I just shook my head. I couldn't believe it. But he, you know, they said Bo's going to produce this. And Eric was so respectful and so professional. And, uh, and he, he made it happen. So we did those songs and, um, And then we had to do one other one, a John Hyatt song. Bob insisted on doing a John Hyatt song. And I had to fly down to Nashville because John wanted a personal meeting with me to see if, if, if I was qualified enough to produce a, one of his songs for Bob Dylan. I, it, it, anyway, um, and so I did, and he was absolutely lovely nice guy, you know, gave me the uh, thumbs up, said, okay, sure, here, take the song. I forget, Had a Dream About You, Baby, or something like that. I don't remember if that was the title or not. And um, took that over and recorded that. And then in, in keeping with my normal routine, all of my musician friends, including Kip, Reb, uh, David Rosenberg, um, that I could get on the session to give them some money and to give them even more, some more recording credits. And so those guys helped me out tremendously. And, and I'm trying to remember that, and we took the thing up to Canada and we did some recording up there. Oh yeah. That's where we did the final, the final big concert scene was done up in Canada. Anyway, it was the worst movie ever. <laughs> and but it was it was really a great experience for me because and I and I shied away from doing more film work because there are so many asses that have to be kissed up and down the line to get anything done. I need to sharpen a pencil. Hold on, we got to get approval. And up and down and up and down and up and down. And so that experience. Uh, I decided, okay, I, this is not for me because the the bureaucracy, and that was a Lorimar film, so it, it wasn't like it was, you know, a big Sony bazillion dollar production. It was Lorimar, and you know they still spent a lot of money on it, but the whole the whole way that the movie, at least that particular movie, ran, was so counter to the way that that I worked because. You, you know, I'm a producer. I make decisions and I follow through on my decisions. If they're good ones, great. If they're bad ones, so sorry, I'll try better next time. But for me to have to wait, you know, uh, five hours to, yes, you can sharpen the pencil, but you can only sharpen it three rotations or you have to get more approval. That was where I just completely lost it. Yeah. So, but I'm glad I had that experience because then I knew where not to focus my attention. Yeah. Well, did you, do you ever get to have fun? Like after you guys finished the song, did you get to go out and have a celebratory drink with Bob Dylan, Ron Wood or Eric, Diet Coke with Eric Clapton or anything? <laughs> yeah. Um, we would go over to, to Bob's trailer and, you know, have a session ender and, um, and, and, Eric, not so much. I mean, he he wasn't actually on set. He he just did music. And so once we finished at the in the studio, then he went home. I don't know where Ron Wood went. Um, but you know, I was I was with Bob because his trailer was right next to ours and and you know we drove back and forth together and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I spent a lot of time with him. That's cool. That's cool. Well, one of my favorite band, I, I'm sure you could probably tell warrant. We got to talk warrant. Um, I know you've told some of these stories before, but um, the cherry pie thing, I wanted to clear this up because I think I heard, I think maybe you just misspoke, but I thought you said something. I've heard you say it in both inter uh, interviews, multiple things that uh, it was Don. Was it Don Erner? Is that his name? Don Einer. Einer sorry. Einer. So Don Einer was the one that said, Hey, we need another song on this record. Um, but then I also thought I heard you say that uh, you said that we need another song on this record. So, but it was coming from Dawn, right? Yeah, uh, both things are true. Okay. So, 
Don told me, I told the band. Okay. So what was, did you have a lot of interactions with Don? He sounds like kind of a fascinating guy because on the one hand, you could, you could argue that, Hey, you know, he's this uh, greedy record executive just cares about money. But on the other hand, I mean, he was right. Uh, I mean, they wrote that song. It was a hit. It made a lot of money. There's people are still playing that song in movies and commercials today. So you know, uh, do you have any interactions with him? Not too much because uh, Donnie was East Coast mm. and we were obviously West Coast. So, you know, the interaction was not not too much with me. I mean, and he would always go through Tom Hewlett uh, and Eddie Wenrick, the management team for Warrant. Uh, he was, that was usually the way that the information was passed to and from. Um, and he, and he had a brother uh, that was like a really, really super big in, I want to say at Columbia, Donnie and something else, Einer. Anyway, they, the two brothers were very, were a real powerhouse in the uh, record industry at that time. Yeah, I said I read something like he was the youngest uh, president of Columbia Records or Sony Record, whatever it was, uh, ever. Like he was clearly like kind of a prodigy in that position, which again, may, maybe people don't like those kind of record execs, uh, but I mean, they did have a role in that business in the eighties and nineties. His his older brother sort of uh, broke the glass ceiling in advance for him, mm. and you know, with his older brother as his tutor, basically. Um, I think, I think that's the way that that went, but, you know, I was not privy to the inner workings of Columbia in the same way that I was at Atlantic. So I, I took more of just like classic, you know, work for hire producer, do your job, shut up. And <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Well, so for the people, I'm sure pe most people, if you're a warrant fan, you know, the story, that uh, Mike Slamer was the guy that played all the solos on the first two records, except uh, the song Cherry Pie. It was actually C.C. DeVille from Poison. For people who don't know that story, I mean, it's in the credits or whatever. It wasn't like they're trying to hide it. But what what was the story behind that? Why did you guys get C.C. for that one song? What, did he just happen to be there that day or, or why did you guys get him? Well, um, C.C. was a very nice guy. He was he would not have been my choice. Uh, to do that but Janie wanted to get a starting slot on the poison tour that was it that was the long and short of it so who and, made the call? like does he call him does he know him or does some, do you have the record people do make that call or something or i i don't remember how they how they did it i was just informed that this is what we're doing and and i went no this is not going to work and then it was wink wink nudge nudge make it work uh, but and, it's CC uh, plane. You didn't replace his solo on that one. No, I didn't. But it it was a lot of work to get what we got. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Wait, tell me this story. What? Why? Why so? Is, is this when he was doing? He was the coked out too, right? The nineteen ninety or eighty nine. Your lips are. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was okay. a. It was a very challenging session for me. Let me put it that way. Isn't that um, kind of your role sometimes is you're kind of like a babysitter with these guys. You're the adult, adult babysitter. Uh, I, I'm the babysitter and I'm the psychologist. Okay. So was there, was it just, he was a little like frantic or was there, was there wasn't like disagreements on how it should sound or something like that. Right. Well, no, it was, it, it was so off to my ear. Uh, the, you know, the approach I mean, everything was just completely not what I what I had envisioned and not what I would have done. But, you know, I sort of come from the school that you you sell your record in the first 15 seconds. If somebody doesn't like it, they've changed the station, they've thrown it out or whatever. And so I had to keep talking myself off the ledge and going, Bo, this is a hit song. Your 15 second rule applies to Cherry Pie hands down. So if somebody likes a song long enough to get to two minutes and 20 seconds to listen to this crazy solo, then you're, you're already there. You're home free. So don't go crazy with this. 
And I had to keep telling myself that all the time, all the time. But nothing against CC personally. He is tremendously funny. I never, I laughed till my my ribs hurt. But when it came down to, uh, you know, to the nut cutting, uh, Mike Slamer, in my opinion, was a uh, hundred times uh, better overall. Uh, technician and guitar player than CC was. I mean, he, Mike is so good that I could say, okay, I'm thinking of something with a little Spanish influence. I'm just making this up, but, and he'd say, how about this? Vroom. No, I want something that's a little more Roman. <laughs> and then he'd do that. CC was a little more, you kind of, you get what you get. And then I spent a good number of hours editing together what became the final take on on uh, Cherry Pie. So you had to edit, like edit notes and things, or what do you mean yeah. by that? Well, what you do is, is is you would comp it. So I would have have him play like a, a thumbnail, uh, three solos on three different tracks. And then I would go through and I would chart out on staff paper or I would just make whatever notes I made so I could get, get the best piece of this one with the best piece of the second take, with the best piece of the third take, glue them all together and see if it if it floated. And so I would that was kind of my procedure with everything. And then I had like my bionic take of CC solo with X number of edits in it. And then be okay this is the best that we got let's try and beat it and so then using that as a baseline we would try to get a better performance and you know most of the time we could um but we're all we were always keeping the best of the best of the best and did then, you so did you have mike slamer play a solo like on the demo or something i don't remember to be honest because the record was done and so this was a this was a uh, an emergency nine one one session, and as I remember it, I don't think I don't think Mike ever ever played on it. I could be wrong. I could just okay. not be remembering properly. So what did did Janie was Janie happy with CC solo? Did was it was because he's the one who wanted CC. So was he like, oh yeah, this is perfect. This is what I wanted. Um, I don't know, but oh yeah. This got me the result that I wanted, so I'm happy. Ah, okay. So it was to get that, and he they did get that slot on the Poison Tour. Yes, they did. Okay. And so he is, he kind of went back and forth with that song, because first he said, oh, I, I hate it, I'm, I'm the cherry pie guy. Then later he said, oh, no, I, I didn't mean those comments. But to me, I felt like he just kind of let the, the truth slip out. He wasn't real happy about that, but he knew that saying that publicly was probably not a good move for his career. Well, I... I talked to Janie about three days before he passed and we had a wonderful conversation. He was completely lucid. He was, it was, and it was one of those kind of things where, you know, you cannot see somebody for five or six years. And then when you connect with them again, it's just like you saw him yesterday. And that was the conversation that, that we had. And he was lamenting about, you know, oh, I'm the cherry pie guy and, and all that. And I said, man, you're really looking at this wrong. You know, you have you have written a rock anthem that they will play at Major League Baseball games and they'll play it forever. And who does that? You, Queen, uh, maybe ACDC, you know, but it's it's a small handful of people that have actually written a song that 90% of the people will know exactly what song it is when you've played the second chord of the beginning of the song. And, and I said, so I, I really think you're looking at this wrong. I, I don't at all. I, I tell people proudly, yes, I was the producer of Cherry Pie because that's so hard to do to be able to connect with that many people over all this time and people still like it. I mean, yeah. Wow. Well, he's done so many other great songs 
Did you, so you had that conversation. Did you ever have any other conversations with him? Did you guys ever have like a deep philosophical conversation? Cause I just think he's such a genius uh, songwriter. So underrated. If you listen to some of the other tracks that are not maybe hits or whatever, um, just seems like a very interesting person that I would like to talk to, uh, you know, have a conversation about the meaning of life or something deep like that. Yeah, we talked, we talked about stuff all the, all the time. And I would ask him, tell me, tell me what's behind I saw red. Yeah. And and we would we would sit there and have a couple of vodka tonics and he would and he would tell me about them. So yeah, it was oh, what have, is behind the song I saw red? Because I love that song. Well, it was it was something very personal to him, obviously. And he was he was a, he was a really really great guy he was a lot of fun to work with and a real super talent and i kept telling him i said man if you ever if you don't make it as a rock and roll musician you'd make it as a baptist preacher <laughs> for sure because yeah. he had that emotion and the heart and the passion oh yeah he he did without without question and he was also tremendously funny so when we would go and have dinner or something outside of the studio, I mean, we were, we were both just cracking up the whole time. I miss him. He was a good guy. Yeah, that's so cool. Like, so what, like when you're doing a song like I Saw Red or another song that I think is really underrated that you, uh, when you went back and you uh, recorded the Ultraphobic, the song Stronger Now, which I think at the time, I remember him saying that he felt like that was the, the best song he ever wrote. Um, how do you coach someone on, getting the emotion out. Is that even part of your job as a producer to kind of, Hey, you need to sing it with more oomph or get more emotion out of this. Or is that something that you're, are you just more sonically about getting the right notes and the things like that? No, I mean, cause part of, part of your job as a producer, you can't leave any stone unturned. And so if somebody's written the greatest lyrics in the world with the greatest melody in the world, but there are absolutely no heart behind it, it's going to come off flat. And and one of my many jobs is to make sure that that it gets, you know, kick up the butt and and I want to feel it because that's got to translate to you, the listener. And if, if you're not if, if it's flat to you, well, it's flat. That's it. It's, it's no good. And Janie, I never had that problem with him. I mean, he wore everything on his sleeve. And every time he went up to the microphone, I got 110% out of him, always. Very That's amazing. I love to hear that. I know you didn't produce the third record, uh, Dog Eat Dog. It was actually Michael Wagner, who we mentioned earlier. But I was curious, like, did you ever hear any of those demos? Or do you think that uh, they could have done something? I love that album. But I'm just curious, like, if, if they could have maybe changed it a little bit, like maybe toned down the guitars not so dark and made it a little bit of a popular record. Cause some of the demos I heard from that era, there's a song called pop music. I don't know if you've heard that one. Um, the, the song thin disguise, which maybe that technically was on the cherry pie, but they could have, they could have put together. I know Janie said, I don't want to make cherry pie part two, but what if they could have kind of just evolved a little bit and made it sound a little bit more like cherry pie. I mean, do you think that that could have been a strategy? <laughs> It certainly, it certainly could have, but don't forget when Dog Eat Dog came out was when all the hair metal music was unraveling in real time after Nirvana. And so with that as the backdrop, I think they wanted to kind of grunge it up and Seattle it up just a little bit, um, which, which was a shame but I understood why they did it that way. Is that why they didn't pick you as a producer? No, it, I was at Interscope. And oh. so my contract with Interscope gave me one outside album per year. And that would have been Winger. What about, um, would you ever go back and remix or remaster some of those songs like uh, pop music or medicine man or, or those kinds of things and, and put out an, uh, you know, unreleased Janie Lane Warrants album? Well, it's funny that you you mentioned that because I just did that with Kicks. Yeah. I, I redid Blow My Fuse and Midnight Dynamite. 
I loved that experience more than I can ever tell you. Uh, so yes, the answer is unequivocally yes. If somebody could get me a digital copy of the uh, Analog Masters, I'm there. Or would you uh, consider producing a new Warrant album with their new singer, Robert Mason, maybe bring in some co-writers and make a classic sounding Warrant album, kind of similar to what, I don't know if you heard the new Skid Row album, uh, The Gang's All Here, but oh God, it just, I mean, it sounds like it's made in 1991. It's amazing. No, no, I, I haven't heard it, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's the quality of the writing that made Warrant so special to me. And and if they wanted to do a new record, and if the quality of the writing was up up to par, then sure, I would I'd look at it. Um, but that's that's really about all, all I can say there. And you know, hypothetically speaking, yeah, because I know you do mostly um, mixing at this point. Um, but do you miss the producing, like sitting in the studio with a band, like old school for like a month and working through the songs? Like that's got to be kind of fun, right? Well, it, yeah, it, it's it's like anything else, you know, it, it's got its good parts and it's got its bad parts. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I, I spent decades as a studio rat and I loved it. Um, you know, and I guess... If I, if I could rewind the, the clock and I could go back and have the quality studios, the basically kind of unlimited budgets so that I could sit in there and really, you know, drill down into the whole process, then yeah, it was. But as, as we watched the record business morph into this new weird thing, whatever it is, um, you know, and the budgets became like ridiculously small um you know it's kind of when you're used to driving a a, a ferrari then it's kind of tough to go back and here's the keys to your vw bus so if, if you kind of get what i'm saying yeah no it's um, definitely changed in so so many regards that yeah i guess in ways it's good because i think it gives bands be that wouldn't have a chance before that couldn't get signed or whatever. It gives them a chance to be heard. But the problem is now it's just such a flooded market. It's like trying to sort through all the music. You can't keep up with all the different bands and things. Well, and the, the other, the other reason why I just kind of mix now is a, I've, I've got my studio in my house, so I'm great there. And a lot of people can figure out how to get, how to record a song on Pro Tools, for example, you know, in their basement, in their underwear, but they can't figure out, okay, how do I make this sound like a radio broadcast ready final product? And it's just, you know, some of that stuff is, is going to become a lost art because, you know, there's the Michael Wagner's and the me's that, came up in the analog universe and then kind of had to scramble the egg and morph into digital and then kind of, but you take all of that knowledge and all of that, um, uh, all the procedure that you learn from the analog universe and all the restrictions from the analog universe, and then you just blow it up in the digital universe. So now you can, if you can think the idea digitally, you can probably do it. Right. Cause you still, there's still parts of like arranging and thing and like, Hey, oh, yeah. I, you know, we need a solo here. Oh, we need a background, like a, Hey, Hey, on this part. There's so many different things that you can do. That's still right. a huge part for the, a real like music producer rather than just doing it with pro tools or whatever. Yeah. And, and especially, you know, I mean, my background is, is, is composition. And so, you know, making sure that the song is set up in a particular way and it tells the story in a particular way and that you kind of guide the listener um, through the experience of that particular song. You know, like I Saw Red it was a perfect example of that. I mean, if you really concentrated to listen to the words, I mean, it took you on the journey all the way. And 
you know, and that's a, that's an art form that you you can't get by you know turning on a a, a drum beat and rapping to it or something, or at least, or I'm not smart enough to figure out how to do that. Yeah, no, I love I love that, and then like I mean, I think it was such a ballsy move to put the like a banjo and stuff on Uncle Tom's cabin on cherry pie at the time. I mean, that was very unusual, but it really still stands the test of time. In my opinion, I think that song is, is one of the greatest songs on that album for sure. Like it's crazy. That wasn't a bigger hit. It, it's a, it was a favorite of mine. Um, and I actually was kind of shocked that it worked as good as it did because I'd never played banjo before and the guys were in Japan and I had a bunch of studio time with nothing to do. And so I taught myself how to play banjo or, or that little bit on, I, I'm not a banjo player, but I was able to fumble through it on that. Yeah. And it's, and also like, isn't the story that's Janie's brother at the beginning and he was just messing around in the studio and you just hit record and you're like, that's perfect. Let's just do, leave it at that. He, he was warming up. And it blew my mind so bad that I like left across the console and, and th threw it into record. And I and I probably missed whatever the beginning of it was that caught my eye, my ear in the first place. But I'm glad I got what I got. And you didn't try to have him take any do any other takes to just see what he could have. No. That was it. It is I'm perfect. Gonna, I love and, it. And I was bound and determined I'm going to make this work somehow. Because he was just he was just ad libbing. He was warming up and ad libbing. It wasn't necessarily in the correct tempo or the correct key or whatever. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I didn't care because it was so such a great performance that I you know. So every now and then you kind of have to color outside the the margins a little bit, and I, which we did on that song. But yeah, I, I kept it. Yeah, those are great. It's funny. I was, I was also, I was going to ask you about the uh, soundtrack songs that weren't did, but I, you didn't produce those. The ones uh, on the Gladiator sound where they did the remake of uh, "We Will Rock You" and uh, I think "The Power" or whatever. Those songs are really good too. But like, you didn't even produce those. Somebody else. I didn't do those. No. Yeah. Did you? You just is that point you'd already left for Interscope too, or is that yeah. just? Yeah, I was not allowed to do it. Yeah, so talk about your that that job that you had at Interscope. Uh, did you like it, or it wasn't kind of really wasn't your thing because you weren't really able to produce as many bands at that point? Well, um, okay, I, I can give you my version of the universe. When uh, I had never been a record company executive at all, I had no, I didn't really understand what that was about, and. When we started Interscope, we had a completely blank slate. So we had, you know, a fully staffed up label with no product. And so it was like, oh, yeah, we got to get that product thing going. And so I spent a lot of my time uh, initially, I wasn't in, in the office at all. I mean, I was out trying to cobble together uh, some deals with some smaller labels, spent a lot of time in Europe trying to get a couple of those small indie labels just so that we had something. And as it turned out, the first thing that we had was Rico Suave, <laughs> which was pretty weird. Um, and then uh, I developed a couple of, a couple of acts and, and then it just, it just fell apart. For me, anyway, the uh, the, the politics were you had you had to really navigate in a very astute manner with the people that were involved there, and I can certainly take responsibility for myself that uh, I was not very astute in my navigating with those personalities. I I was just more of a what the fuck are you talking about, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and that uh, ultimately it didn't it didn't rub very well you know on the on the the people that that I was uh talking with and the other thing you know the whole concept about you for an A&R meeting which happened once a week and everybody sits around 
around the table and it, it takes hours and you get very little done. And so I, I kind of lost my patience with that. And I preferred to be in the studio working on something. So I guess I sort of ostracized myself from uh, from the Interscope culture just because I just I didn't understand it. And what I did understand, I didn't particularly like, but it was a situation that that on paper, it looked really good. And Jimmy and I did a, a lot of a lot of meetings, a lot of everything for like a year and a half before we actually officially did Interscope. I mean, we were talking to Irving Azoff about doing a label with his record company. I think it was Republic at that time. And, you know, and so we we were scratching everything that was out there. So a lot of time was spent. And then when the, the whole Ted Field thing came up, um, we had already agreed in theory to doing a sub-label deal with Doug at Atlantic. We hadn't signed the paperwork or anything like that. And then Jimmy walks up to me one day and he says, listen, I'm not doing the deal with Doug. And I was like, what? He said, nope, I'm going to do it with Ted Fields. And I said, well, who's that? And he said, well, he's the owner of, was it, uh, it wasn't Aquavision. It was, anyway, uh, he said, uh, this guy's worth $1.2 billion and he's he owns the office building on Wilshire Boulevard. The 10th floor has already been carved out for Interscope and um, his budget for the first was like $100 million or something. It was something crazy. And Atlantic had, or, had, had offered Jimmy and I $10 million. And so Jimmy being Jimmy went for the money. And he said, you know, uh, Ted's got all the office space. He's got everything all covered. He's, he's got a budget of $100 million. I'm going with him. So that's how that happened. And that gave you a chance to sign a band that you were really gung-ho about, right? I mean, was there some bands that you were like, oh, this I love this band. I know you uh, did some uh, Unruly Child, I think, was one. And uh, I don't know if Black Bambi was on. Interscope, but those ones, they didn't work out, but were those projects that you were excited about at the very, time? Uh, very. Black Bambi was Atlantic. Okay. And that was a was a, a tragedy because of backroom politics. The manager did not get along with the powers that be at Atlantic. And so it doesn't have anything to do with the band and it didn't have anything to do with me. It was just, you know, oil and water didn't mix. And so it was like, see you later. You know, and Atlantic could write off a, a baby band project like that and not blink an eye. Um, as far as uh, Unruly Child goes, I absolutely loved that band. And there is a story to this. The record was done, finished. And we were going for a celebratory dinner at a Mexican food restaurant right around the corner from A&M Studios in L.A. Hey, well, let's get together for eight o'clock. We'll have dinner, slam a couple of margaritas and high five each other and off we go. OK, so everybody shows up and then Mark chose that moment to come out and become Marcy. You know all about that, right? I don't know that I do. Wait, refresh my memory. Okay, Mark Free is no longer Mark Free. He is okay. Mark. And he chose that day, that dinner, next door to A&M Studios to come out. And so he came dressed like Laura Petri from the Dick Van Dyke show. Full makeup and the whole bit. And... And I just sat there, and as soon as I saw him walk in the door, I went, we're done. We're toast. Because Mark was like Robert Plant, you know? I mean, he was a big stud lead singer, and now all of a sudden he came in, and he he was like, uh, <laughs> I 
I don't know. So I sat there and I was just. And this is what, what year is this? Like 1990. This is before this was kind of a trend that's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You bet it was. And, you know, and at that point I was I was going, OK, so. Let's uh, let's try to imagine what the next A&R meeting is going to be like around this. And it did. It was not uh, wasn't taken very well. So everybody was expecting Led Zeppelin and we got Tiny Tim. And that's that's no reflection on Mark. Mark's a great guy. Great. Or Marcy is a great person and a great singer. And and I wish her nothing but the best. But that one move at that one moment in time torpedoed that record. And I think it also it also had a certain um, negative effect on my standing within Interscope, if I were going to be completely honest. I mean, and I'm sure that people kind of held me responsible that I should have known or suspected or something, but I didn't. I wasn't looking for that. And I had no reason to look for it because Mark showed up as Mark every day. And mm -hmm. so anyway, it was just another one of those one of those tough, unexpected lessons that we learn in the uh, record business. Yeah, but it's amazing. I mean, just because it seems like it's so hard to have a hit song and a hit record and you produce so many that were hits, like your track record is still pretty good based on, I mean, your whole career. It's pretty amazing that you had that many hit records. Well, you're too, you're absolutely too kind, but yeah, you're right. And you know, because I've been asked this question before and I came down to, like there's three elements that I could associate with pretty much every hit record that I had. Number one, you had to have, I mean, obviously great material, but you had to have MTV, you had to have terrestrial radio, and you had to have impact at bricks and mortar records. And you had to have complete harmony between management, label, agent, artist, producer. You had to have everybody on the exact same page. And, it, and when you had those elements together, then it was, and, and you can probably talk to other people that, that have had similar experiences. And when those elements are present, then your chances of, of having success are exponentially kind of off the chart. Yeah. And so what would you say the formula is for success in the music business now? Because it's clearly changed quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, my, my idea of the formula now is don't quit your day job. <laughs> huh. Okay. So what are your thoughts on like, um, I don't know if you know, I'm, I'm assuming you know the story, but maybe you don't, but like Oliver Anthony, that kid was just this little country singer in uh, Virginia or something blows up with this song and uh, out of nowhere, just the thing goes viral. And, uh, but he's very like anti-music business. He wants to keep his ticket costs low or do free shows and things like that. What are your thoughts on him? Cause I, I find it, I like the song and I find, but I find his personality very interesting. Yeah, me too. Um, I have to be honest that the whole uh see i'm not i'm not on facebook or any of that stuff homie don't do any of that so i'm not sure how the whole the whole marketing and the likes and i don't like and i'm influenced and i'm not influenced i'm not really exactly sure mechanically how that works just because it's not anything that interests me in the slightest so I don't really know what buttons this kid pressed to give him that overnight sensation, but clearly he hit a nerve. Um, and I, and maybe, maybe that's the one benefit out of the sort of the digital social media thing is that if you manage to press the right button at the right time, you can start having his kind of problems, which are good problems to have if you're a guitar playing songwriting musician. Yeah, I don't tend to be smart enough to know how to do all that stuff. It's interesting to me because he's, you know, he 
which I think is cool that he wants to keep his ticket costs low or do free shows. But I feel like people are still going to make money off of him and he's just not going to get a piece of the pie. Right. So like he could do a free show. Hey, I'm doing a free show at this place. But then the venue is going to charge people for parking and they're going to you know, charge twelve dollar beers and you know, ten dollar hot dogs. And he and if he doesn't get any of that, it's like he's not he, people are making money off him and he's not getting a piece of the pie, which even if he want, he doesn't want the money, he could give it to a charity or something. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Well, then it, for for a situation like that, if if he was asking my sage advice and guidance, I would say, get yourself the most cutthroat manager and attorney that you possibly can. And if and then you lay out the rules, these are the yeah. rules that I will play by. And and if not, that's it. And then he won't get taken advantage of like the twelve dollar beers and the twenty five dollars right. for parking and shit like that. So. Yeah. Well, so what? Yeah. Well, explain why you're not on social media. Just I would think you'd want to uh, just just do it just for the uh, fact to keep in touch with all these people, like you know the Winger Kids and all you know all these other uh, bands and musicians that you've worked with. You don't want to you don't have any interest in uh, seeing what they're up to and chatting with them. Well, I do. Um, oh, okay. I just just got back from the final kick show. Oh, you I, went to that? Wow. Of course I did. I wouldn't miss it. And um well here's here's the thing. I guess the people that want to find me can find me. You found me. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So and it happens. I mean, I have artists from around the world, a lot of whom I've never met, reach out hi, how's it going? Blah, 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 blah. You remember us? We mixed so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. And the whole idea about like sharing holiday photos and things of that nature, I don't want anybody to know when I'm home or when I'm not. And the people that I want to share a photo with, I just email it to them. So I've got an email list of like 50 people. And if I take some great, mind-blowing, earth-shattering moment, on a trip somewhere, I'll send it and uh, and correspond that way. But the whole the the whole social media thing has has I never really understood it, and I, I never really understood why people are so into it. Um, you know, because if if somebody is is influenced just because somebody else posted an opinion. And then I, to me, I'm like going, huh? I don't, I don't get that. So, cause I have this funny thing of, I make my own opinions. And the only person that really influences me is she who must be obeyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's just hard. Like if you have a band or if a podcast such as myself, like you kind of have to be on social media because that's how you get your name out there. That's how you, but if you've already established a, a name for yourself, I guess, yeah, maybe I guess you don't need it. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, now I could be totally wrong, but when's the last time you, uh, you got a Facebook post from Mutt Lang ever? No, I don't. Is he, he's not on social media either. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, cause I'll find, uh, you know, I, I have besides musicians and producers and people in the music business, there's people in the movie and TV business and authors. And there's a lot of them that I, I you know, I check everything. I check LinkedIn, I check Twitter that they're not on there. And it, that's frustrating. At least you have a website so I can find you. But some of those people, I'm like, I don't know how to find these people. Yeah. Uh, and, and the, the guys that I've worked with that, that want to stay in touch with me, they do. Yeah, the guys that don't want to stay in touch with me, they don't, and uh, and I'm okay with that either way. Uh, That's what I've noticed too. Is the older I get, the smaller my circle gets. Like I, I just have, I have my girlfriend and a few close friends and family, and and uh, I don't need all the other. I mean, I have the social media, and I just post stuff, and it's kind of like I want to just post and ghost and just get away and not because I don't want to interact with all the uh, the the riffraff. You know, just the there's a lot of. Uh, trolls and things that that's one thing that you probably are glad you don't have to deal with is people making comments if like if you did post a vacation photo or whatever people would criticize it or say it's crooked or whatever you know like it's just stupid things yeah I, I i don't need that in my life so you know and i'm 
I'm good. Get up, go to the driving range, hit the gym, come home, mix a little bit. And then uh, six o'clock, open a bottle of wine with my wife and life is good. What kind of wine do you like? Oh, I'm a shard guy. Oh, you like the whites? Yeah. Okay. My wife is red. Totally. Yeah, I like I like Pinot Noir. That's my favorite. Yeah, that's good. It's all good. Yeah. When, when you were in the 80s and 90s, I mean, I know you were just, you nose to the grindstone. You're a hardworking guy. I don't think that you went out and did a lot of partying, but there must have been one or two times where you were able, invited to some maybe label party or something. You must have seen some crazy Hollywood Hills parties, star studded. Is there any stories you have like that? Because just for an average guy that grew up in the suburbs, we don't have those kinds of stories. Like, is there something that you saw that you could, I know your lips are always sealed, but is there something you can tell me? <laughs> well, since, since you've uh, spoken to Piercy, he probably told you about Rat Mansion West, right? Uh, was that before they made it or after? It must have been after, right? It, it was kind of during. Okay. Because they, they did a couple of gigs uh, you know, in the in, up up and down sunset, I think while we were doing the first record, and they always had had um, these crazy parties over at their apartment. And their apartment is one of those that was kind of a square with the swimming pool in the middle, and they called it Rat Mansion West. Which and they had a couple of apartments up there, and that thing was absolutely insane, and. So, you know, there was that, and then there were also probably a, a few label things that got pretty out of hand. And, you know, and probably if memory serves, there were probably a couple of late nights at the studio that, that got pretty adventurous. And, uh, but generally speaking, and I mean very generally, um, you know, I had I tried to have a, a good time as much as possible, but I realized that I'm a day person. And so for me to pull an all nighter and be slamming vodkas at three in the morning meant I was completely shot for the next day. Right. And so I tried to. To, you know, tame it down just a little bit to where I could still keep my regular schedule going. Well, you said like rat was more fun on tour than they were in the studio. Cause it was like, there wasn't, you guys were just, it was more of a social thing at that point. Right. Yeah. Were they the, who was the most fun band? If you were going to have that late night or, or was it warrant or was it rat or a different band? Um, it, it wouldn't have been rat. Cause there's, there's too much internal strife with those guys. So it wouldn't have been them. Um, it would have been kicks. It would have been Europe. And it would have been and warrant. Yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah, I, I bet it would have been fun to to party that that blood, sweat and beers tour. I just hear so many stories. That sounds like it was just a blast. It was, you know, a warrant trickster and firehouse. That seems like it would have been a really fun tour to hang out with on a, a night. Oh, I'll, I'll bet it. I didn't. I didn't go on that on that tour at all. But I'm I'm sure it was probably a riot. Yeah, very cool. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Great stories. I uh, so many things that I'd never heard before. I appreciate you telling all the stories. Um, I always end promoting a charity. Is there a charity that you want to promote here at the end? Tunnel to Towers. What's it called? Tunnel to Towers. What is that exactly? Um. It's a Frank Siller is the uh, CEO, and it it uh, they build houses and take care of mortgages for fallen soldiers and first responders. Oh, see, this is why I love doing this because I always find out about these charities. I've never I've never heard of that one, but it sounds been, amazing. That's great. I've been tunnels to towers, and the reason why I like this is that ninety six cents out of every dollar goes to help the vets or the uh, gold star families, things like that. That's amazing. I love that. I will put that link in the show notes along with your website. If people want to contact you, sure. you'll do mixing for them. Um, not obviously for free. It's a, this is your job, right? So, but uh, you, you still work with a lot of bands. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, there was one I heard. Uh, I, I think they might have just recently broke up, but it was called Dust Bowl Jokies. And you did a song for them. And I was like, whoa, this is kind of a cool band. Like, is there a lot of newer bands that you've heard that that sound good like that? Yeah, I mean, if, if there's if there's if there's no redeeming qualities, then I'll just politely say thank you. I, I can't really help you. Yeah. Um, so, you know. There's some redeeming quality in all of these little weird offshoot things that I do. Um, and, and that keeps it interesting for me because I had no idea how they recorded it, what mics they used. All I, I just get the result at the end. And it's kind of like, you know, if you if I was a chef and I made beef stew and I gave it to you and I said, OK, pick out all the green peas, <laughs> you know, that's kind of what they do to me. It's I, I become kind of the musical janitor. It's, they just give me this stuff and it's like, fix it. But you love it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. And and the more I do it, the more I realize I really can fix it. Yeah, yeah. No, you're great at what you do. Thank you so much for doing this interview. And, and thank you just for your contributions with music. I mean, the the music, you've made the music world so much better to me. All these records that I've grown up with, I got to listen to, you helped make, create those. So thank you for all that. Well, you're, you're absolutely too kind and it's my pleasure. All right. Well, thanks, Bill. We'll stay in touch. Okay, we will do. Okay, See you later. bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.